Here we go, chapter 13, AC measurements. We've talked about, in introduction to uh, meters earlier in ELEC 110, <laughs> AC measurements are a little bit different. Um, and we're going to have to use some different equipment with that. So this chapter is going to outline, outline uh, those differences. After completing this chapter, you're going to be able to identify the types of meters available for AC measurements. Identify the types of meter movements used to make AC measurements. Explain the function of an oscilloscope. Identify the basic parts of an oscilloscope and explain their functions. Demonstrate the proper setup of an oscilloscope. Describe how to use an oscilloscope to make a measurement explain how a counter works, and then identify the basic parts of a counter. AC meters, the meters that we use for measuring AC, are all based on the design of a moving coil meter movement. And what I'm talking about here are the analog instrument. You've got to understand the analog before you can understand how the digital work. This type of meter movement is referred to as a Diarzenval meter movement. And a Diarzenval meter movement is designed to measure DC current. Designed to measure DC current. So if you start talking about like the instruments on the dashboard of your car, your gas gauge, your engine coolant temperature gauge, all of that stuff is typically based on this design. So it's designed to measure DC current, but we're going to want to measure what with it? AC. So therefore, AC current must be converted to DC current to be measured. So even if you're using an AC meter, basically that AC is getting converted to DC, and then it's going to show you the equivalency of what's present in the circuit. This process of converting AC into DC is called rectification. Rectification. The rectifiers are going to convert the sine wave into a pulsating DC current. But the key word there is DC current. It may be pulsating, but it's not repeating itself. AC goes back and forth. Remember two alternations? Now we're just going to have one alternation. Positive, 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 positive. Because we're rectifying it. Okay. Um, Again, so if you see one of these on sale or whatever, it's well worth its weight. But if you plan on doing a lot of AC stuff, um, this is actually very nice to have a digital meter like this. Um, or if you're also doing a lot with DC, um, and for any of you that want to get into alternative energy or anything like that, having one that does DC or automotive applications, I mean, I find, I find it real handy to be able to stick that across my, my cable and see exactly what am I drawing out of, out of my battery. But typically these are higher values of current. You're not going to you know, see the difference of 250 milliamps um, you know, on something like this. And of course this is analog. The model that I've seen at uh, Harbor Freight is an analog meter. So as I saw, yeah, that was my first indicator that you're on an analog meter there. I couldn't see the face of it, is that you're studying it normally with a digital 1.26 volts. You know, I mean, it's instant gratification. Here you got to look at this needle. Um, but it is still prevalent. Now, the single most versatile piece of test equipment available for working on electronic equipment and circuits is the oscilloscope. Is the oscilloscope. Also, the number one thing that I hear from students when they graduate, you know, I normally talk to students when they're going to graduate and, you know, what do you, what do you think you got? You got a good, did you get a good education here? Did you learn anything? What would you like to learn more about? And I always hear, I wish I knew more about the oscilloscope. Uh, the oscilloscope is such an important instrument and it's pretty intimidating. There's a lot of knobs and buttons on it and, um, the better you know how to operate the oscilloscope, the more effective that you're going to be as a technician. There's no question about it. Invariably, in a job interview, uh, they're going to sit you down in front of an oscilloscope. I did it to Peter. I hired Peter. When I brought Peter in, it was the first thing. I had a little circuit that generates a signal. And um, I actually have a, uh, a fluke scope meter. So it's like a little handheld meter, but it's got an oscilloscope on it. 
And I've come to find out that Peter actually hates those things, which was good. So I sat him down and the wires were all tangled up and everything. And I'm like, tell me what's coming out of test point 22. So he's got to set the oscilloscope up. He's got to turn the thing on. He's got to get it all calibrated. And, you know, uh, this is actually funny because uh, I asked him, uh, I said, what's coming off test point 22? Is tell me as much as you can about it. And he said it was a square wave. And then I said, well, what's the duty cycle? You know, and the duty cycle is a parameter that we measure. And he looks at me like, duh. If it's a square wave, the duty cycle's 50%. And it was funny, I had these PhDs that I had interviewed, and they're like trying to calculate it out. Well, do you have a calculator I could borrow? It's like if it's a square wave, the duty cycle's 50%. If it's less than 50%, it's a pulse wave. If it's greater than 50%, it's a rectangular wave. So if it's a square wave, just tell me it's a square wave and the duty cycle's at 50 So Peter was the only person that got it right. But that was one of the things. I, want, I could tell so much about a, a person's background on how they approach using the test instruments. So that being said, every opportunity that you have in the lab, try to use as many different models. That's the other thing, too. I could have gotten better discount buying in bulk of multiple scopes. I want different brands in there. I want you to have the opportunity to play with different models. How many of you here learned how to drive a Ford? How many of you here tr tr learned how to drive a Chevy, a Toyota? How many of you here learned how to drive a car? You see my point? Learn how to operate the oscilloscope. And I'm living proof. Tektronix had the contract with the military. When I was on active duty in the military doing sophisticated electronics, I believe the only company in the world that manufactured oscilloscopes was Tektronix, because that's all I was used to operating. Then I got out of the military and I'm like, I don't even know how to turn this one on. You know, I was so used to that brand name. So don't get used to the brand name. Make sure you try all of the different models and get proficient in all the models, because then you'll really learn what's going on. Now, the nice thing about an oscilloscope is, uh, it's for those of you that like to watch, if you know what I mean, I don't even know what I mean. <laughs> it provides a visual display of what's occurring in the circuit. A visual display of what's going on inside the circuit, which is really cool. This is a oscilloscope that at one point I was intimate with, the Tektronix 2440. And what this is, is a digital storage scope. And this is a combination of an analog scope and digital. It'll actually provide us with some digital readouts on the face of the oscilloscope. What is this? Batter battery? Uh. <laughs> it works when you point it up. We could see that it's actually processing some data and providing it to us in a, in a digital display, but yet we're getting an analog representation of the signal that we're evaluating. So this is kind of a marriage between both. Oscilloscopes provide us with the frequency of the signal. The frequency of the signal. The duration or period of the signal. The phase relationship between signal waveforms. The shape of a signal's waveform. And the amplitude of a signal. Now the basic parts of an oscilloscope are the cathode ray tube, CRT, the sweep generator, horizontal, and vertical deflection amplifiers, power supplies. The first part we're going to talk about is the cathode ray tube. This is a vacuum tube. It's a vacuum tube. Inside the vacuum tube is a phosphor screen. Phosphorescence, I don't know if any of you have been boating at night on a cruise ship or anything, and you can see the wake of the ship, and it's kind of like glows in the dark. Okay? It's because all these microbes and stuff. I remember once Cape Cod, I, f I was getting a bunch of blue crabs in one of the inlets, capturing them, and then, you know, we'd cook them up and eat them. 
and um, uh, the shells that were all left over, they actually started glowing in the dark. And um, there was no nuclear power plant anywhere near uh, where I was getting these crabs, so they weren't radioactive. It was just a phosphorescent reaction of, of what was taking place. Also inside the cathode ray tube is an electron gun. The electron gun shoots electrons. The electrons come out in the position of the electron beam is controlled horizontally with these deflection plates and vertically through these deflection plates. And when the electron beam hits the phosphor screen, it causes the phosphor to glow in the dark for a brief moment in time. That allows you, the technician, to take a reading as the image is painted on the scope face. So let's turn this classroom here into a giant CRT. And I'm going to come to the back of the class here, and I want you to use your imaginations here in looking at the screen. Let's imagine that the screen right now is coated with phosphorescence, and I have an electron gun in the back of the back here, and I'm pointing it at here. Does that make sense? So when the electron beam hits this, if I turned it off right now, it would glow in the dark for a brief moment in time and then gradually fade. So the first thing that I'm going to do when I turn the oscilloscope on is these horizontal deflection plates are going to be driven by a time base inside the oscilloscope. We're going to talk about that in a second. And what's going to happen is this, remember last week we talked about a sawtooth generator? The sawtooth generator is going to create a voltage that has a long rise time, linear, and then a short linear fall time. And we're going to couple that voltage to our horizontal deflection plates. And when I turn it on with my electron gun, what's going to happen is it's going to pull this across the screen along linear rise time and then gradually it's going to shoot back really fast faster than the, na the naked eye could even see it. Does that make sense? Can you envision that? And can you envision that if it glowed in the dark for just a brief moment in time? We would begin to perceive it to be what? Nothing more than a, a static image, a straight line going across our oscilloscope face. So the horizontal deflection amplifier is, or the horizontal deflection plates is driven by the horizontal deflection amplifier. The horizontal deflection amplifier is actually driven by the internal time base that's actually calibrated. It's got more in common with a stopwatch than it has with a voltmeter because it's a calibrated time base to pull that beam across the screen in a, in a, in a predetermined amount of time. Now, our vertical deflection plates are controlled by our vertical deflection amplifier. Our vertical deflection amplifier is fed by what you connect your probe to. So when you connect your probe and touch your probe to an AC signal, that signal is going to be amplified vertically and then it's going to control the voltage across these deflection amplifiers. So remember before on how I was pulling my beam across the center of the screen? Now what's going to happen is as I'm pulling it left to right, I'm also going to pull it up and down based on the signal that I'm looking at. So can you envision, I need your imagination here, but can you envision of what this would actually look like if it glowed in the dark for a brief moment in time? It looked like a sine wave. Very good. Got to use your imagination, I said. Use your imagination. <laughs> okay? It would look like a sine wave. Okay? I got a positive alternation. I got a negative alternation. And over a period of time, it's changing. The oscilloscope is functioning. So that's how an, that's how an oscilloscope works, at least the cathode ray tube portion of it. Does that make sense? The reason I'm beating this to death is if you understand... If you understand how the oscilloscope works internally, I could put you down in front of any oscilloscope and you're going to look for horizontal controls, vertical controls. You're going, to, you're going to look for these basic parts. It's like learning how to drive a car. If you know that a car has, it's kind of funny. Um, I learned how to drive it. It was an automatic. 
okay? But I learned how to drive standard. Nobody taught me standard. I was mechanically inclined. I understood how a gearbox worked. I understood the function of a clutch. I basically got in a car and just, okay, clutch in, first gear, release the clutch. You know, a little bit of finesse is required. I figured it out. Nobody had to teach me how to do it, you know? I remember my son, who's less mechanically inclined, but he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. Um, that was a... It's a pretty sore day teaching him how to drive standard and the jerk and he just didn't, you know, but once you get the feel, you figure it out. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to understand these functional parts of the oscilloscope, then I can put you down in front of any brand name and you at least know what you're doing. Make sense? Okay. The next part, believe it or not, and this is a pretty important part of the oscilloscope, is the faceplate. The faceplate is marked in centimeters, typically centimeters, along the vertical and horizontal axis. Typically, it's 8 by 10. 8 squares high by 10 squares across. And each one is graduated, so you end up with all these little squares. Now, these squares can be calibrated with a known voltage before testing an unknown. And that's how the oscilloscope is set up, is every square. And I saw you guys in there together, where was it, yesterday, today? Yesterday. And you were looking at that, and every square was worth 5 volts with what you were looking at. So if you've got 5, 10, 15, and then 3 more, 15, 18, about 18 volts you are looking at, peak value. Okay? So that's why the graticule markings are calibrated for this known voltage. And that's what they're called, is graticule markings. Kind of like the, cross uh, the uh, crosshairs on a, on a scope or on a periscope. It provides you with range information if you know how to read them. It's mounted in front of the CRT, and all it is is a reference standard. Don't laugh, but the power switch is usually on the front panel. And actually, for job interviews, I've tried to find some oscilloscopes that had the on-off position in a very unusual place, and then I just want to see how people struggle with it. You know, they're trying to, you know, they know how to operate the oscilloscope. They must, because they're engineers and stuff, but they don't even know how to turn it on. Because this particular model is a little switch you reach in the back and you depress it, you turn it on, and I don't know, I find that entertaining, you know. So always make sure you know how to turn the oscilloscope on. Maybe a toggle switch, push button, or a rotary switch. Sometimes it's mounted separately or with another switch. And what it's do, it's, it's used to apply line voltage AC to operate the oscilloscope. It provides voltage to the power supply that brings the oscilloscope to life. So make sure you know how to find that switch. Intensity switch, also called brightness, controls the electron beam within the CRT. It's usually a rotary switch. You have to be careful because too much intensity for too long can burn a hole or etch a line in the phosphor screen. If you just sit that electron beam just sitting here all day long, it's going to burn a hole in it. It's going to burn that phosphorescent coating. This is one of the reasons, I don't know if you realize, like screensavers are called screensavers. Because originally computers used a CRT and that image sitting there all day long is going to burn that image onto the screen. So over a period of time you want it to switch to something that's going to move and change or just your screen to go black is fine. So this is again one of the qualities that I look for in a technician. If you're working for me as a technician, if you're taking a reading, you, tune, you, you turn your intensity up. You take your reading. And you turn that intensity up so it's very, very dim. Because the dimmer that it is, the crisper and clearer your line will be on the oscilloscope. And the more precise you are in taking your readings. Does that make sense? As soon as you're done taking that reading, you just turn the intensity down and you go back to whatever else you're doing. If I walk by you more than once, twice, three times, and I see that image on the oscilloscope up, I got a beef with that. You're putting additional wear and tear on the machine that you really don't need to. Just turn that intensity down. Oscilloscopes don't come with screen savers. Focus and astigmatism controls. These are connected directly to the electron gun, and they're used to adjust the electron beam size and shape. And these are rotary controls. Okay. Focus and astigmatism deal with the focus of that electron beam on the oscilloscope face, on the phosphor coating. Think of this as like a fire hose or like your garden hose. You know sometimes you want to find mist, other times you want a direct beam, okay? 
with the oscilloscope, you always want the direct beam, but you have to have the ability to control that, so you end up with a pinpoint beam. So focus and astigmatism controls will control that electron beam, so you get a sharp, focused, clear point where it comes in contact with the phosphorescent coating. Horizontal and vertical position controls. These are really self-explanatory. Horizontal posi posi position can moves your image horizontally on your oscilloscope face. Vertical moves it vertically up and down. Don't be afraid to adjust those because you may want to align your image just so with the graticule markings so that you could take a measurement. It's okay to move it horizontally and vertically. That's why they have these controls, so that you can align it with those graticule markings so that you can make an accurate measurement. It's designed that way. So it allows the electron beam to be positioned anywhere on the face of the CRT. This is a, uh, a typo. This should say vertical block up here. Vertical, not horizontal. The vertical block, and that's the section that we're talking about. And by the way, this is, I'm going to give you a helpful hint here. When you're talking about the oscilloscope, I don't want you to remember the ABCs of the oscilloscope. I want you to remember the X, Y, Zs of the oscilloscope. Now the reason I say the X, Y, Zs is, does anybody know what my X axis is? X axis is horizontal. What is my Y axis? Vertical. What's my Z axis? It's what's coming at you. So you've got to get those three things working for you. You have to have a horizontal display. And what data is it that we look at horizontally with the oscilloscope? Time. Very good. What do we look at vertically? Amplitude or voltage. Very good. And what do we look at in our z-axis? What's that? No. What does the z-axis mean? I don't know. You told me. I'm not going to answer your questions. These are my questions. <laughs> what is the z-axis? What did we say the z-axis was? What's coming at you? What is coming at you? Electron beam. So what do you think we control when we control our z-axis? The electron beam. So we're going to control things like brightness, astigmatism, focus. It's what's coming at us. And those are those controls. So think of it, break the oscilloscope down into that, is I got my horizontal controls, I got my vertical controls, and I got my z-axis controls. Make sense? So, my, my vertical block is going to consist of a vertical input jack. This is where you connect your probe to. An AC-DC switch, so you can listen to AC-DC while you're operating your oscilloscope. Now actually this is so that, are you looking at an AC signal purely where you want to discount the DC component? Or do you want to look at the DC component as well? Because sometimes we have AC that's writing on a DC level. So as soon as you connect it to the circuit, your signal may jump off the screen and you can't even see it. If you're just concerned about the AC signal, set it for AC and then it won't jump off your screen. If you're concerned about AC and DC, then put it to DC and then you'll see that AC signal jump up and then you could say, okay, yeah, I've got a small signal writing on a 24 volt DC level. So you got, kind of got to make sure this is in the right position. Then we also have the volts per centimeter rotary switch. This shows exactly what each graticule marking is worth. The other day in the lab, when I caught you working on labs, it was 5 volts per centimeter. If you change that position switch, it would be 2 volts per centimeter, 1 volt per centimeter, half a volt per centimeter, or whatever you set it for. Make sense? The oscilloscope probe is connected to the input jack. And all probes are not created equal. You can have an oscilloscope probe that's a one-to-one -one probe, meaning whatever you measure in the circuit is going to be read by your oscilloscope. You could also have a ten-to-one probe. That means whatever you touch in the circuit now is ten times less going into the oscilloscope. By you simply getting another probe, what did you do to the oscilloscope? You just extended the range of it by how many times? It's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. By just getting a, a 10 to 1 probe, you just extended the range of that scope 
by, by 10 times. They also have 100 times probes. We really don't need them here at Lake Washington for any of your stuff. The 10 times probes come in handy. 100 times probes, we, we really don't recommend you get one of those. But 10 times probe is definitely good to have. The horizontal block is also called the time base, right? Because this is our horizontal information, <coughs> our electron beam going left to right. It's going to consist of a time per centimeter rotary switch, a trigger control switch, and a trigger level control. Remember when I said when you're operating the oscilloscope, you got to pay attention to the, what did I call them, the XYZs? I left out an important part. You do have to pay attention to the XYZs, but you also have to pay attention to what's known as triggering. Have any of you here ever discharged a firearm before? What do you got to do to discharge a firearm? Pull the trigger. You gotta pull the trigger. That's where these people that get shot in accidents and all, I... <laughs> yeah. I never understood it, but then again, I was classically trained in the military on handling firearms, so I never saw anybody get shot by accident in the military. Saw some people that were involved in training accidents. <laughs> That's another story. Now, to discharge a firearm, you gotta pull the trigger. To get a display on your oscilloscope, you have to... Anybody want to take a wild guess? Pull the trigger. Got to pull the trigger. Now, you could either pull the trigger manually, which I don't recommend you do. Because if you pull it manually, you're only going to get one image on your oscilloscope face. You want to get a regular image on your oscilloscope face. So the best thing that you could do is set your oscilloscope to what's known as automatic internal triggering. So what it's going to do is whenever it senses a waveform starting to either rise or fall, depending on how you have it set up, it's automatically, as soon as that threshold is exceeded, it's going to start to display. So if you're looking at like current coming out of a wall outlet and you set that, every time that waveform starts to go positive, it's going to start to display. So what you're going to get is a nice stable image on the oscilloscope. Every waveform is going to be nice and stable and you're going to see it and perceive it as a stable image. The number one problem that students have operating the oscilloscopes is the image is jumping all over the screen and it looks just like an image jumping all over the screen. That is because they don't have triggering set up properly. So if you could opt for automatic triggering, do it. If you could opt for internal triggering, do it. All of those oscilloscopes have that feature. If you don't have triggering set right and the threshold set right, it's that, you're just going to end up with nonsense on your screen that is not useful information. So you have to have not only the X, Y, Z, but you also need to have the triggering set properly. The level control sets the amplitude that the triggering signal must exceed before the sweep generator starts. This would be like, again, for some of you with firearms experience, this would be like your ability to set a hair trigger. What does it take for me to discharge this firearm? A simple little bit of movement on the trigger or solid pull on the trigger? And I, I've never shot competition or whatever, but I guess some people play with that, you know, so a little bit of pressure, boom, and it go, you know, discharge of the firearm. Half of the stuff that I shot in the military was, uh, you had to pull on that trigger pretty good to get it to discharge. So this level control allows you to set the threshold that will cause the oscilloscope to start triggering on. Now, this next thing here is the initial oscilloscope control settings. I'm big into uh, checklists. I'm big into checklists. As a matter of fact, my whole adult life has been revolved around checklists and standard operating procedure. Okay, it's how I live my life. As a pilot, I wouldn't think of getting in an airplane and not using a checklist. 
because it's so easy to miss something. And let's face it, an airplane cockpit is pretty complex. There's a, there's a lot that you could miss. Some of it for me is ritual and muscle memory. Some of it, you got to go through that checklist. I highly recommend you make your own internal checklist on operating the test equipment. And if you consistently follow that checklist, you're going to end up with good results every time. Okay? I've been doing this so long, I've got the checklist for the oscilloscope really in my mind. And you know what my checklist in my mind is going to consist of? X-axis set, Y-axis set, Z-axis set, triggering set. If I know if I got those four things set properly, you know what I'm going to get? A display on my oscilloscope. If one of those four things isn't set properly, I'm not going to get a display. So, this will serve as a, as a basic checklist um, for an oscilloscope. Intensity, set to center of range. Focus, set to center of range. Astigmatism, set to center of range. Position, set to center of range. Triggering, triggering set for internal positive. Level, set for auto. Time per centimeter, set for one millisecond. Volt per centimeter, 0.02. Power to on. And if you follow this checklist, you're probably going to get a display on your oscilloscope. Make sense? You'll probably get a display on your oscilloscope. So be ritualistic about it. That's one of the other things, too, that you'll see. I'm going to do it to you in lab from time to time just to mess with you because you're here to learn. You walk away from your lab, especially if you leave the, the signal, the intensity turned on, and you go take a coffee break and I walk by, I'm going to come over and I'm going to screw up all the knobs on your oscilloscope. And I guarantee you right now, you could put any oscilloscope in front of me and screw up all the knobs, I'm going to get an image up on that scope probably in 60 seconds because I've got this committed to memory because I've done it enough. So the moral of the story is the only way you guys are going to get that good at it is hands on. Keep challenging yourself. One of the things, it's not, this is not an assigned lab per se, but I highly recommend you guys pair up in groups of two or whatever in the lab and do that to each other. One of you leave, let the other one totally screw up all the positions of all the knobs. Also, let me, I want to show you one thing here. Let me go back a slide. Intensity set to center of range, focus set to center of range, astigmatism set. What's, do you see a trend here? What is that trend? Set to center. Anybody want to take a wild guess how this oscilloscope was set when it left the factory? Yeah, set to center of range. When a device is calibrated, that's the first thing they do. They put all those controls to the center. Then internally they make adjustments to align it. So that when it leaves Cal, you set it to the center of range, you're going to get a good display. Now gradually over time things change and you might have to change the focus or whatever a little bit, plus or minus. That actually used to be a technique that the old TV repairmen used to do. What they used to do is get it to the edge of range and then make an adjustment internal so that eventually as you tried to change your brightness, you're going to have to call them and say, I can't increase my brightness anymore. They'd have to come back for a service call, charge you money for it. When that television set originally left the factory, everything was set to center of range. If you go through a calibration procedure and you get an instrument back and it's not calibrated center of range, you done been ripped off. It used to drive me nuts once I understood calibration and everything. That's what you always go for. You set to the center of range, then you make the internal adjustments. A really cool device out there that's used for AC is called a frequency counter. Frequency counter. This measures the frequency by comparing a known frequency against an, in, an input frequency. Consists of a time base, an input signal conditioner, a gate control circuit, a main gate, a decade counter, and a display. This is what the block diagram of a frequency counter looks like. What you do is you connect your input here. The input comes in. It's processed by this input signal conditioner. and sent here to this main gate and counter circuit. The main gate and counter circuit compares a known existing time base to this gate control circuit and does a comparison of the two and then displays the unknown frequency to you on this display. 
The electronic counter is used in and on electronic repair shops, engineering departments, ham radio shacks, industrial production lines. Sounds like really exciting stuff, right? Let me add something to this list. If you want to sweep a room for bugs, all you need to have is an electronic counter. You could buy an electronic counter on the internet with an antenna on it and set up a counter surveillance business. And you could go into a room and sweep that room and if you're finding a frequency, first of all you gotta understand the design of the room and what else is going on. But you come in like in this room right here, quite frankly, um, if everybody's supposed to leave their cell phones outside, I can't imagine anything in here. My computer is going to be sending out a frequency, um, an internal frequency, so I'm going to get something out of the computer. But other than that, no, if I'm walking up and down these benches here sweeping and I come up with something that's emitting, I just found something that's broadcasting out of this room that doesn't belong to be, uh, it's not supposed to be broadcasting out of this room. So frequency counter is like the most fundamental piece of counter surveillance equipment that there is. You go to a hotel room, you're afraid somebody's got a hidden camera in a hotel room or something, you know, that your wife put, or your best girlfriend put a camera in there to catch you with your neighbor's wife or whatever the heck, you know, what, I don't even know. I don't even know what I'm talking about when it comes to that stuff. I'm so straight-laced, it's not even funny, seriously. <laughs> but no, I mean, if you're in some kind of a goofball hotel and you're just concerned or whatever, boy, you sweep that room and all of a sudden, you know, you're getting a 2.4 gigahertz hit the heck is this? And you're looking in the lamp and you find a little pinhole camera or something. I think you'd be surprised how many people have cameras and are doing goofy stuff like that. The other thing about the electronic counter is, um, and this is not necessarily deeply, it's not classified anymore, it used to be one of the holiest of holies. Holiest of holies, Ser seriously. When I was on active duty in the military and electronic intelligence gathering, the Russians, the Soviets, used to, in the design of their radar systems, use crystal oscillators. And these crystal oscillators were extremely stable. Very, very, very stable. Too stable. I had equipment, I had a frequency counter that could go many places past the decimal point. When you turned your radar on and I intercepted that signal and I analyzed the specifics of your signal, I could see many places past the decimal point and then I, because you were crystal controlled, it gave me a fingerprint of your radar. So if we could get close and I could see the hull number of the ship, the name of the ship, the, the uniform, the ball cap that somebody was wearing, whatever, and we could correlate that to the name of the ship. We had an electronic fingerprint of that ship. Do you realize how critical that is? You could, you could have a target that's over the horizon, and as soon as they turn that radar on, because a radar is designed to go out, have enough signal, and then come back. The basic principle of my job was that we had to be able to pick up something one, two, three times the distance. So all of a sudden, we're sitting way over here over the horizon. They don't even know we're there, and their range, their radar can't even pick us up. And I know exactly who you are. I know exactly who you are, what vessel you are, and what your capabilities are. And then I could relay that information. It's like, hey, Skipper, this isn't a problem. These guys don't have anything that can reach out and touch us anyway. Or in the middle of a fog bank, all, all hell breaks loose and war starts. Yeah, that's the bad guy. We know exactly who he is. Fire. Take him out. <laughs> They're gone. And we know exactly who he killed. So imagine if the police could track your car like that, which with low jack and some of the other stuff, yeah, but imagine if by simply by you starting your car, you had an electronic signature that the police could track. Now, if you're a God-fearing, uh, you know, uh, tax-paying citizen, it's not a problem. If you're a criminal, and they can track you like that, you got a problem. So it was simply an electronic counter that somebody stumbled upon this, and it was really one of the best kept secrets of the Cold War. It was one of the reasons that the Soviet Union crumbled, because all of their military infrastructure was based on that design of electronics. 
and it, we could exploit the dickens out of it. Simply by them turning on their stuff, we knew exactly who they are. Now we also assumed that they knew that we knew. I know that sounds confusing. I actually got in trouble for about that once. Because I it was like dealing with like the holiest of holies, really top secret information. And I'm like, hold on, this this information is about like their stuff. Don't they know what they got? You know? Hey Officer Grenick, you have a bad attitude. No, but honestly, don't they know what they got? Yes, they know what they got, but they don't know that we know what they got. If you know what I mean. <laughs> no, I still don't get it. But never mind. Yeah, I got myself in big trouble over that one. It was just <laughs> big briefing his admirals there and stuff. It's like, Grenick, why don't you keep your mouth shut? That was a legitimate question. <laughs> Silly me for thinking. The wide use of the electronics counter can be attributed to the integrated circuit, which has reduced the size and price, increased its accuracy, increased its reliability, increased its stability, increased its frequency range. So again, you can look at that frequency counter, handheld frequency counter, do a Google on it, and you'll probably come up with a number of different hits, small handheld, stick an antenna on it, or you know, if you're really going to the counter surveillance business, some kind of a goofy pole with a little sensor on the end, and you're you know, like a divining rod, <laughs> okay? Except a lot more high tech. And it does work, that's all you need. That's all you need. And there's so much, I tell you, if you start paying attention and you own one of these devices and you start paying attention to what's in a room, what's not in a room, you get an image. You, could re you really learn a lot about what's going down and what sensors are available. The Bodhi plot, named after H.W. Bodhi. I don't know why I got to use an accent when I, it just sounds like H.W. Bodhi, a big 10 gallon hat, driving a big Cadillac <laughs> with horns in the front. This here's my plot. <laughs> It's used for studying amplifier feedback. That's the good news. The bad news is it requires the use of semi-logarithmic graph paper. Have any of you here in the past ever used semi-logarithmic graph paper? Right. The reason we use semi-logarithmic graph paper is what we're looking at here is actually audio. And audio is nonlinear, so we have to use a um, semi-log paper. Uh, two graphs are going to be plotted out. One is going to be the gain in decibels. Gain in decibels. The other is going to be the phase shift in degrees. Now at Lake Washington Technical College, we do not own a Bodhi plot. If you worked at Harmon Carden, you'd have access to one. If you worked for what's a big uh, automotive uh, audio Bose, you'd work you'd have access to these. Um, for the type of stuff that we're doing here, buying the semi-log graph paper would break our budget, so we don't have one. We do have computer simulations, and that's good enough for what we're doing. Computer simulations make them easier to use, which is good news for you. They're used to measure voltage gain or phase shift of a signal, produces a graph of the circuit's frequency response. This is very useful for analyzing the effectiveness of filter circuits. In summary, measuring AC current with a moving coil meter, everything gets converted to DC. So even when you've got your meter set for AC, it's set for AC, but that means the AC is going to get converted to DC and you're going to get the equivalent C or the effective value of it. The iron vein meter, we talked about the clamp on meter, we talked about the oscilloscope, oscilloscope. We talked about the frequency of a signal, the duration of a signal, phase relationship between signal waveform, shape of the signal's waveform, amplitude of the signal. We talked about the inner workings of the oscilloscope, the CRT, the sweep generator, the horizontal deflection amp, the vertical deflection amp, the power supply. We talked about frequency counters. It's not your father's frequency counter anymore. You can buy these things handheld, battery operated, great devices. We talked about the parts of a functional block diagram of a frequency counter. Time base, input signal conditioner, gate control, main gate, decade counter, and then finally the display. And basically, he who has the display that goes, 
the most places past the decimal point wins the Cold War. And that's the truth. And then Bode plotters, great for um, analyzing amplifier and filtration circuits. We don't have one here, but on multi-SIM, it is one of our icons. You could drag that into your circuit and analyze to your heart's content. Any questions on anything that we covered in this chapter? AC, yes? Yeah, why does Oslo have a pin table? Um, nobody's invented it yet for it. No, because technicians are considered smart, so they know just turn it down when it's not in use. How does it work? How does a screensaver work? Yeah. It's just a timing circuit. Um, a screensaver in a computer is nothing more than a timing circuit to initiate a program that's going to change the value of what's being displayed on, on, on the... So if, it's, if a keyboard is inactive, that timer is counting from the last time you touched a key and it's just sitting there and it's waiting for how long and then once the 10 minutes, 15, however you have it set, then automatically it's going to put something on that changes the image on your screen. You know, one of the other things that was kind of interesting um, during the Cold War is that for everything that I worked on that was super classified, if you had a computer monitor that displayed top secret information on it, that computer monitor now had a designation of top secret. Even though it's unplugged and it's removed because part of the image could be burned in there. And they found Russians, Soviets, that were going through our junk bins trying to get stuff and then trying to pull an image back up. And I'm going to be honest with you, if they could figure out like this computer monitor is used as a weapon system and look at they could go to hundredths of a degree or look at the resolution that they could go to in a speed control or whatever you gain intelligence from that and the more that they could learn then it was all useful information um, I have two questions the first can um, LCD or LED monitors still be Any image that sits there for an extended period of time could cause degradation. Um, LED, LCD is not as uh, pronounced as like plasma. One of the worst things you could do if you got a plasma TV is, you know, and you're playing TiVo, freeze frame, and then walk away for the day and, oh, uh, you come back that night, you're going to have an image probably burned on your plasma screen. So um, I recommend keeping fluid motion on any display. Um, because it's gonna, you could have some degradation. And then when, um, when AC is converted to DC for the measurement of the meter, does the meter just measure the top peak of the positive sine wave of the AC? It actually measures 70.7 percent of that top wave. It measures the effective value. When you're measuring, when you get a, when you get your meter and you measure coming out of the wall here, it converts the AC to DC, and then it it actually represents 70.7 percent of what's coming out of that wall, and that's what we consider. So right now, how many volts are supposedly coming out of the wall? 120 volts. That's 120 volts, which is the RMS value, and we did this last week, right? 120 volts RMS is actually like 170, 167 volts. Uh, 1.414, I know that number, 120 times 1.414 equals 169.68 volts times 2, 339.36 volts peak to peak, wow. divided by 2, 169.68 volts peak times 0.707, no, oh, I messed up, 120, 120, vo 120 volts RMS. Make sense? All right, we're going to go ahead and take a, about a 10 minute break when we come back. Chapter 14. 14 will be the easiest chapter that we do.